All right, welcome everyone. What an extraordinary treat we have today. Lema Bowie, who is the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, is here with us to talk about her life and journey. And um, I'm so pleased to be able to talk to her in a conversation for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for your questions. Um, I'm Michelle Anderson. I'm the president of Brooklyn College. I'm honored to be here. This is uh, a real treat for us. And uh, Lema is also going to be the recipient of the honorary degree from Brooklyn College at graduation this year. <laughs> Which is just uh, spectacular for us as an institution to be able to honor you in this way. So we're hoping that all the technology works. Hello to anyone who is watching on a live stream, if that is in fact working. Um, hello to everyone here. Uh, so I'm going to let the conversation uh, just flow here and introduce you a little bit more through the conversation. Uh, and we'll, we'll start at the beginning. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your childhood in Liberia. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, Brooklyn College. <laughs> It's always good to start at the beginning because we live in a world where people tend to see a book at the end chapter. It's very good to start with the introduction. I, am, I consider myself a daughter of, of the community, a daughter of the generosity of many people, and a daughter of many tribes. I grew up <clears throat> in Monrovia in a small community, peri-urban, a lot of poverty, but also a lot of love. Um, we grew up with our parents and our grandmother lived next door, but she was our primary caregiver. We were five sisters, um, no brother. So obviously we had to learn to throw punches <laughs> as children because there was no one to fight for us. Um, but we grew up in a community that was both Christian and Muslim, um, people from both religious groups. So as a child, we celebrated Ramadan, we celebrated Christmas, we celebrated Easter. There was no distinction. We grew up with a sense of Ubuntu. You know, I am because of what we all are, or I am. You know, so if you went, 5 p.m. you were dirty, you were at your neighbor's house, they bath you and send you to your parents' house. Our grading system in Liberia, the school system was March to December. We started school in March and we ended in December. And you got your report card, most of the schools got their report card December 17th. So that evening of the 17th, you had to take your report card and go from house to house <laughs> to show to every neighbor. So imagine those who fail. You got smacked for um, spoiling your parents' money. Those who passed, you got a dollar coin, depending on, so it, it, literally, that's how we grew up. We grew up with many stories and folklore. Um, recently, I was telling someone that when the lights went out, all of the different children from different ethnic groups came together and we danced traditional dances and we sang songs and our parents sat on their porch. So that was my growing up years. I got my voice, I would say, from my grandmother, who I would tell you was my first feminist teacher. She died last year at 115. She got married when she was probably between 13, 12, 13, 14, like that have her first child around there. And she said, the first time her husband beat her, that child was two weeks old. She left him and left the child with him. Mm -hmm. And so that was revolutionary for those years. She went on, remarried three times and would tell her, you were just living your life without. She <laughs> said, yes. And so when we're growing up, she used to say to us, a common theme, if your husband brings rice, you must be able to bring the charcoal. So it was really teaching us to dominate our space. Mm -hmm. 
that's how I I, I, I now translate. Can you tell us what Chaco means? Chaco is Oh, the, charcoal. Yes. Okay, so Sorry. charcoal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or firewood. So if your husband brought rice, you must be able to bring the firewood, pay for the fire. So basically, that kind of economic stability, yes. um, interdependence, mm-hmm. not being dependent on people, those were the things that she taught us. The other thing that I learned in my childhood, and I, as I'm talking, I'm listing several things. One, the sense of community. Two, the sense of religious tolerance. Three, mm-hmm. that she taught us, and I've used this many times in speeches. When we were growing up, we noticed that she was the person who visited the community rejects. People who no one visited, Mao visit. One day, my sister Josephine and I went to her to say, oh, that someone told us this old lady was a witch. And we decided to repeat that story to Ma. And she said, tying her hair, she was a very serious person. She was tying her hair tie, and she said to us, I remember like yesterday, you're following me to the old lady's house. And we started crying, oh Ma, she's a witch, she's going to eat us. And she said, I will whoop your behind if you don't go ahead of me. She took us to that old lady, and we continued going there until we graduated from high school. And I think what she taught us was being able to cross borders and, 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 and doing your own investigation instead of judging people based on what everyone said. So my growing up years was, I tell people I don't have the story of the typical African child. I wish I could say, oh, we were suppressed, we were oppressed as girls. My father was an only child. But he treated us like we had a voice. Mm. In our community, my grandmother was a traditional priestess. And she was a member of every secret society in Liberia, including the male secret society. That's how powerful she was. And we had to go through the process of the Sunday, which would have taken us through FGM. And even though she was the one teaching us independence, my father was the one who told them no one would touch his daughters. So when we were young, if we got into trouble, instead of taking the whip, he would say, sit down. Explain to me, why did you do this? And my mother would be like, why do you want to listen to them? And he said, everyone has a voice. So really and truly, on every side of my growing up years, it, we, we were in a space of empowerment, and not the typical story of the African girl that is out there. Wow. What an incredible childhood. When did, you know, violence and war changed your life and the lives of the entire community and the entire country? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, when that happened and what that meant to you and your family? So at 17, two days after my high school graduation, the country went to war, 1989, December 24th. Or one day, we graduated on the 23rd, and the war started on the 24th. That turned our world upside down. I just described a very beautiful childhood. I said we grew up in a bubble, and it was a poverty bubble. Because you say, oh, that rich child grew up in a bubble, you know, of wealth. We grew up in a poor bubble, but a sense of community. We didn't know who father didn't work because meals were shared in our community. If some family member died, everyone put their resources together. We owned the only television set in our neighborhood, my father. But evening time, 5 p.m., they put everyone outside of the house and we form a queue with every child and they will smell you to see if you are taking your bath. That's the only way you could watch television. And even though you lived in that house, but if you smell bad, you were going to bed. You were not watching television. So it, it, it was that sense. And then the war came, and all of a sudden, you start to hear you can't interact with this ethnic group. And you, so that kind of, it, it confused me as a 17-year-old. Because my best friend till today was from the ethnic group that everyone was calling evil. But prior to that war, I slept at their house. Their mother washed my clothes. She took care of me. How all of a sudden I'm being told you can't interact with those people. So for the years of the war, what 
built up in me was a lot of anger at the destruction of what I knew to be my normal, my socialization, my world had been crumbled into pieces and people were now telling me that the first 17 years of your life was an absolute lie. And I think that shaped me into coming to where I find myself because that anger is something that I carried for a long time. Well, the anger that the first 17 years of your life was uh, a lie. Yeah. Um, Lema, I'm realizing that I've made a mistake in terms of where we're sitting. The live stream is right there, and I'm on the wrong side. You should be so sitting should I be here. Looking no, no, no. You, we should just switch seats. Come, sit here. Michelle, uh, that's what you call authentic. <laughs> When the president of Brooklyn College realized that, mm, I don't know anything about technology. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. That way, the live stream can see you. So, so, yes. So there you go. Through, yeah. So, um, the war has started. You have a sense that the first 17 years of your life may have been a lie. That must create extraordinary pain. And the war continues. It's a long war. What gives you, inspires you, allows you to have the strength to think about how to organize to stop the war? Well, it wasn't that easy. It didn't yeah. just jump. The story didn't jump. I carried anger. I made a lot of mistakes. Growing up, I wanted to be a pediatrician. I am so far from that career choice right now. <laughs> um, so I, it was, I was angry, very, very angry. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I told myself I wasn't going to school. I would not go to university because one bullet could undo four years, eight years of education. Why did I want to spend my time going to school learning stuff? And so then I had this deep sense of anger for this group of child soldiers because I felt like these were the people who brought um, terror on us, because they were the ones that were typically visible, visible to me in all of the war years, young boys with guns, and these were the people I hated the most. So as the war progressed, I had children. I was in an abusive relationship. I had a very, very terrible experience, especially when I had my third child, he was two pounds, and we were refugees in Ghana, and I could not afford um, the hospital bill. So we were placed in the hallway, and he was not put into an incubator. I did not know that when you put your baby here, it was a form of incubator, but I kept him there because he was so tiny. We slept on that floor, and people would pass and throw coins at me and give me bread until one woman, someone went to her room and said, oh, there is this very pretty girl out there with a baby and they're sleeping in the hallway. She came out of her room and said, come, because she was in a private room waiting to have her baby. And I remember sitting in that room just crying, crying my eyeballs out. And she took my son, changed him, put some clothes on him because she had baby clothes. And she, she waited and I cried and cried and apparently she got so sick and tired and she just turned and said, shut up. <laughs> you need to shut up. <laughs> and then she asked me, have you been to school? I said, yes. And she said, now you have to take the challenge to take over your children's life. Even if you don't have money to send them to school, you have, you've learned the alphabet, teach them, teach them stuff. No one will do it for you. You have to be strong for these children. I left that relationship after several years, moved back home, and decided to go to school. And I want to say, tell this story for the young girls in this room and the young boys, because it's so easy for us to say, I can't. I had gone to do my Associates of Arts degree in social work in the entire semester. I never raised my hands once in class. Remember, I'm coming from an abusive relationship. I had zero self-esteem. And so they gave us a psychology assignment. 
I poured my everything into that assignment. I was nursing sick babies. At that time, the kids had increased to four. I was nursing sick babies, sleeping, staying up all night writing. When I got that paper, I read through it and told myself I would get an A. When they brought the paper back, I got F. I looked at it, and for many years, it was like a dismantling of the disempowerment that I had gotten to. I said, I will go to the professor. So I walked to him and said, sir, you graded my paper without reading it. I said, I've sat in your class all semester. I've never spoken. And because I've never spoken, you saw my name and you graded my paper. He shouted for a moment and said, give me that paper back. Come back next week and we'll talk about it. Next week, I went back. He handed me my paper. I made an A. And he said to me, you are right. I didn't think your paper was worth reading because I had never heard from you the entire semester. Mm -hmm. As I walked out of that office, I told myself, Lema, no one would judge you on the basis of your silence. Henceforth, you will use your voice in this world as you step out. You will speak. People will never. So that was the beginning mm. of finding my voice. Midway into it, there was this deep sense of uneasiness because I volunteered at a, working with child soldiers. And I decided I had to leave this job, work with women on a volunteer basis. And that's when we started the Women's Peace Movement. When we started, I had zero understanding of where the hell I was going with all of that. I had read one magazine about Bosnia, Herzegovina, and how women in that community had mobilized to supply basic social services. And that was the only understanding of women's work that I had. And I was just bringing people together on the basis of compassion or whatever. I heard about the West African Women in Peace Building Network. I wanted to bring the concept back to Liberia. So it was just trial, error. And then one day after a training, a group of women came and said, why don't we do something? And the thing was they wanted to work on HIV and AIDS. Midway into us trying to figure out, someone said, but the war is closing in. So let's do something about the war. But I had this dream way before then where someone said you need to gather the women to pray for peace. That was in the dream? In the dream. Wow. I was lying on the floor. I had no computer at the time. And please don't let you not having anything stop you. I, you that because I didn't own a computer, I had a notebook. And Michaela, if you look in my bag, you will see that, I, yes, there is one there. I, for a long time now, I carry notebooks, even with a computer, because I write my ideas. Trust me, when I'm old and gone, it's going to be a lot of money on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was right. I woke up and I went to my boss, who was a pastor at the time. I was volunteering. Young people, there's a lot of nuggets coming out here. Volunteer. I was volunteering at this job that was paying me zero dollars. And I went to him and said, sir, I had this dream. And he was a pastor that someone actually told me to gather the women together to pray for peace. I said, but sir, you know that I'm committing adultery because I'm in a relationship that I'm not married to this person. I can drink 24 beer without getting drunk. <laughs> I can party. And like all of the excuses that we as women have been taught that you can get into spiritual spaces if you're doing these things. So can you get, call the women in your church so that I can give them the dream? And he looked at me and said, Lema, listen to these young people. The dream bearer is always the dream carrier. If you give your dream to someone else, you will not recognize it the next time you see it. And so we started the Christian Women Peace Initiative it morphed, the Muslim women came and said, can you teach us how to do this? We did. And then it morphed into the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. But it was a journey, first of letting go of these child soldiers, 
really understanding that they did not do a lot. They were victims of the war. And then, I, I think, because my faith is important to me, I think my journey to being an activist was actually dealing with all of the loopholes that I felt was a reason for. So the anger, the everything, I had to deal with it in order to get to that place. And what I recognized when we started activism was that you can't give what you don't have. You can't be a peace activist unless you have a sense of peace. And that even though anger, people tend to think is bad, but anger is not. Anger is this. Anger is fluid. It's not a good nor bad. Dr. King was an angry man. Rosa Parks was angry. Mandela was angry. All of the great men and women that have done great things in our world are angry or were angry. What we have when we are confronted with our anger is two containers, the violent container and the nonviolent container. You become a hero when you determine that you will pour your anger into the nonviolent container. Mm. You're remembered as a villain when you pour your anger into the violent container. Mm. I tell people, you're no better than the person on death row. The difference between you and that person on death row is that you took a step back and breathed, whereas they didn't take that step back and they took an action. We all carry something. So that anger, my anger, was pouring it into a nonviolent container with this group of women starting something, putting our pain in front of the world to confront the detectors, to confront the warlord, and to transform our nation. It's possible that people here don't know a lot about the civil war in Liberia. Can you describe it a little bit? Oh, wow. So in 1989, so Liberia has a very, how do we describe it? <laughs> <laughs> the history is scattered. We, we say scattered in Liberia. It's messy. So Liberia was a place where, when at the end of the slave era in this country, there was an organization that was formed by Congress called the American Colonization Society, <laughs> ACS. And they were looking for a place to carry black people because there was a lot of contention that if black people stayed here, they would override the white population they would take over, blah, 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 so they needed to go back to the continent. ACS was giving $250,000. Liberia as a nation was a project. It was not supposed to be a nation. It was a project, so they brought these free slaves first. And then the group that came were predominantly mixed race. Children of very wealthy, farmers who wanted a good life for their children, lives that they would not live here. So you had the mulattoes coming, and they came, and after a while decided, we want to do a nation. So Liberia is literally a carbon copy of the US. Our flag is the same as the US flag, except with one star. We use the US dollar still today with the Liberian dollar, simultaneously. We have the same branches of government that you all have. We, our president gave the state of the nation address. Elections is almost around the same time. Yours is October, our, I mean November, ours is October. The state of the union you have in January, that's second Tuesday or Monday, we do the same thing. Um, we have a chief justice, we have a Supreme Court, everything. For a very long time growing up, we sing, my country days of the sweet land of liberty. I don't think some of you know it, but. <laughs> <laughs> land of my father. Everything came from the playbook. When you salute the flag in Liberia, I pledge allegiance to the flag of Liberia mm. and to the republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Sounds familiar? <laughs> So then these free slaves came and they formed a country, 1847, and did exactly what was done to them on the plantation 
to the indigenous people. So for 100 years, there was suppressive rule. If you had my last name at the time, you couldn't go to a particular high school. So segregation was there. Everything else was there. And then in 1980, there was a coup. And the indigenous people took over and executed publicly 13 of the most powerful descendants of free slaves. And from 1980 up until today, it's been take for tack. In 1990, a descendant of free slave, Charles Taylor, who was in a maximum security prison here in Massachusetts, mysteriously left prison and started a war in Liberia. So that is a synopsis of the history of Liberia. And tell us a little bit about the war itself. So Charles Taylor... So he came, he comes. waged his war, and we, at the time, our population was between 2.53 million people. They were able to successfully kill 10% of the population. No one was spared. So one, he came and was fighting the government. Later on, he group splinter into another and another and another. And before you could even think, there were 14 warring groups like it happens in every country around the world, fighting to take power. Eventually, Taylor becomes president of Liberia, but decided instead of taking the path of reconciliatory de democracy, he wanted to remain a dictator and a warlord. It led to another round of fighting in 2003, and it was in 2003 that we stepped out and started protesting 14 years of the loss of our innocence, the loss of children, the loss of everything. And we, we did that for months until the signing of the peace agreement and continued until 2005 when we had elect elected democracy. So you're working with a group of women who are focused on HIV AIDS, but then pivot because the war is closing in. Yeah. And um, it's just an extraordinary story. I'd love you to share some about it, what the women did. Um, how it started and how the engagement evolved. So one day we sat down and said we did that to end the war. Someone had $10 in her bag and we said, let's write a statement. So young people, we wrote a statement. We had the worst detector in the history of our country. And then they say, so what do we say on the statement? Someone said, write women of Liberia. That's fraudulent. It's just like sitting behind your computer and writing a statement and saying we the people, in, even though it's just you. <laughs> so we said, let's, let's name ourselves. So we named ourselves, we took out $10 and sent it to the press. And the next day, every media group wanted to know who the crazy seven women were. Seven. Seven of us. Seven. We named ourselves in that statement. In that statement, we were calling for immediate unconditional ceasefire a fruitful dialogue between the warring groups and the deployment of an international intervention force. Those three things made it very dangerous for us because those were the exact three things that our president at the time was saying he was not going to do. He will fight until the last soldier died, that he was a sovereign government, he could not negotiate with fighters, warlords, and three, Liberia would not allow foreign troops on its soil. So we were actually going at loggerheads with him. So people wanted to know who were these women. And it took off without any idea of where we were going. We learned as we, 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 we were doing activism and advocacy. After seven women, we went to 20 something, we went to 60 something because we kept inviting people. Then they went to 250 and then one day in April, we decided let's unveil our movement. That day, 2,500 women showed up, all in white, and we put our statement out. Eventually, we decided we wanted to meet with the president. He would not see us. We kept going back and forth. But one of the things that we did, we had a consistent presence where we protested, and we had a group that we were writing statements and sending it to every embassy. So anything you could think about, we were making up as we went along the way, fasting, prayer, media engagement. As a matter of fact, in Monrovia, people used to say the women have taken the madness pill because we were just from one place to the other in our quest for peace. 
And this was Christian and Muslim women together. Christian, Muslim women of all social backgrounds, women from all different political groups, because we had come to the place when we sat down to start the movement. One of the first things we asked ourselves, does the bullet know a Christian from a Muslim? Can the bullet pick and choose? When a Muslim woman is raped, the pain she feels, is it different from when a Christian woman is raped? When a Muslim woman lost her child, is it different from when a Christian woman lost her child also? So we have all of these things. What do we have in common? Our collective humanity, beyond the politics of our country, beyond the politics of the warlord. How can we harness what we have to really step out there and do the work for peace? Because it's not about us, it's about the future of our children. So there are thousands of women coming together. Why do you think you are a leader? I have no clue, and I did not want to be. <laughs> I did not want I resigned a million times. Like, I would resign and go home, and then I would see, like, 50 women come and sit in my house and say, we came to take you back to work. Ooh. But I think because the vision, the dream started with me. Right. And, and trust me, it's not that we didn't have decent in the group. People came up with the story that the they, um, they, they group is a spiritual process. And I had a relationship that I wasn't married to. I was not Christian enough. And it took the older women in the group to bring the entire group together to say, hey, listen, let's go back. And me and the Christian women, they had the most self-righteous attitude in our movement. So it took the Christian women, older women, to say, sit. Go back to the Bible. Who is Rahab? She was a prostitute. Who was David? Who was this person? Who was that person? It said every great person that God used in the Bible were some people or individuals that had flaw. It is not for us to judge. And so those women said, if you think you cannot stay under her um, voice, you should leave. Some people left. Some people left. But the more people that left, triple their number of women came and joined us. Then we had the challenge with the, the Muslim women. Taylor had a Muslim wife. And his Muslim wife went on the radio to say, if you're a Muslim woman and you were sitting with us, that you were going against the wishes of Allah. And then the chief imam went on the radio to say, all through the history of the Quran." Peace is all through the, all through the, the scriptures of the Quran. So any Muslim women who did not join our movement was not doing that day we have had hundreds of Muslim women join us. So we really had a strong backing wow. from the Christian church and from the, 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 the Islamic group. We came together and it, it wasn't easy. But this morning we talked about being authentic when we had our conversation in your office. And I knew that there were things that I had to tell these women, you know, about my life that I was unable to do. A lot of them saw this process as a spiritual process. So fasting and prayer was one of it. Immediately I had to say to them, I had never fasted in my life. I did not know that spiritual process. And they said, are you open for us to teach you? The answer was yes. But midway into all of the instructions, I realized that that was my weakest point. Mm. The way I would tell it to people, I like food. <laughs> you know, so it was very hard for me to stick to. But it didn't cause them to judge me. It didn't diminish who I was. But once then these older women who never went to school told me many things about leadership that I carry today, and I think it's something, because people tend to think that when you're a leader, you should be glorified. One old lady said to me, a leader is like the trash can. You get all the dirt thrown in, and you must be able to take it. Another person said, I learned from the get-go that as a leader, you had to be the first to arrive and the last to leave. The first to serve and the last to be served. You had to serve or you, you could not serve what you could not take. 
you always had to serve what you could take. And so there were many things that I learned along the way as a leader in the movement. And I tell people till today, if I went to Liberia today and told those women, I'm mobilizing you to walk down the road, they will follow me. Because as a leader, I proved to them that it was never really about me. It was about the call that we had. We never went to any dangerous place where I was not in the front of the line. When we were walking, if there was space in the car for only four persons, it was never me. It was other, four other people. When it was time for me to raise my voice, I raised my voice because I felt it was never about me, about those women. And how did I learn that? Every morning I wanted to be the first on the airfield where we sat. Every morning, one old lady beat me to it. Every morning, I tried to go. It's like she read my mind. I would come 5.30, she would be there 5.15. <laughs> so one day, I sat next to her and asked her, why are you here? Because her cloth was torn. Her T-shirt was not even white anymore. And then she asked me, do you have a son or sons? I said, yes, I have two sons. At that time, they were two. Now, they're three. And she said, I had two sons. My first son died during the first wave of fighting. And my second son just died. And then I heard that women were fighting for peace and I decided to come. I'm here to make sure that you don't lose your two sons. And that was a moment for me till today. She would never get on a plane to come to New York. She may never present at the UN. The benefit of peace may never really come to her doorstep. She may never get a government job or get any kind of compensation. But she was selfless enough mm. to be in that space, present, because she didn't want it to happen to someone else. Mm. Afterwards, that was my drive, and that remains my drive till today. Wow, so it's like the dream that you had uh, then became that moment as well. That came, became part of the dream. Yeah. So I'd love you to describe uh, the experience of the peace talks, the demand to Charles Taylor and the warlords that peace talks occur, and then what the women did to ensure that that happened. So when we protested for a while, we were trying to get a meeting with Taylor. And then we finally got this one meeting. And then they said if we were less than 25, they would not allow us into his space. But we were over 3,000 women that showed up that day. And so when we got there, the guy said, if you're less than 25, you can't see the president. And then I said, what if we're more than 25? Because the women had gone, and they were standing at the university. And the university is not far from the executive mansion. And he said, they said, ha ha, okay, if you're more than 25, you can come. So I whip out my cell phone, and I told the women, form a queue, and start coming down. When they looked, oh my God, these women are serious. Sea of whites. Yeah. And then they call President Taylor and say, mm-mm, there's a lot. <laughs> and then he said, oh, I will see only 10. Oh, so now it's 10. And then I said to them, I'm going up there to give him a piece of my mind. And I was in a rage. And then as I was going, the security was like, sister, why do you want to get killed today? Mm. Halfway up the stairs, they then said he had agreed that he was coming down. So when he came down, he had his seat, his cabinet, and then they offered us seats. We sat on the floor. Like really save our disobedience. And then he's sitting here, and they put the mic here for me to read this position statement, but my back would be to him. And I said, no, I rearranged the entire mic, and he just sat there with his dark glasses on looking at me. And I gave my statement, but I felt the statement the women had written was too neat, so I had to add in <laughs> from my head. <laughs> Because also, it wasn't about me. It was about all of those internally displaced women who didn't have places to sleep and had come that day to protest. 
He agreed to go to the peace talk. Prior to that day, he had refused. So then we had to send a delegation to where the warlords were for them to agree. Then we decided to go to Ghana. Which and is where the peace talks were. Where the peace talks were being held. Our purpose for going to Ghana was to be in the corridors protesting because we didn't have, um, no one granted us accreditation to be observers at the table. So every were day- Were there any women? Oh, Taylor was the one who pointed out the women he wanted to be observers at the table. I see. And so they went. And so for a long time, when we were protesting, no one paid us any mind. We were like the mad people. And then the, the former president of Nigeria, who was the chief mediator, called us one day and said, I want to give you seven slots around the table. And I said to him, no, we don't want any slot around the table. The women were enraged. Not only was it going to give us money to sustain our protests, but we have a voice around the table. What they weren't looking at, people, those of us who are looking for notoriety, had we agreed to go around the table, there were already five women around the table, we would have fought each other from the moment we walked in that room because they would have seen us as people who tried to take over their space. And that's what he wanted. Yes. So once we said no, this meeting was at 7 a.m., we came out of the meeting and the five women who were around the table were seated in front of the room that we were having the meeting. How did they know? So once I came out, I said, I need to see you all. I said, they just asked us to be observers at the table. And we said, no. Now you all listen to me. We are partners and no more antagonist. You go in there, whatever you hear, you come, write it, give it to us, and we will put it on our placards. So we became partners. But it was very difficult for us to break through. One day, there was this bombing in Monrovia. Two kids were killed. A pregnant girl who just delivered was killed. I was raging mad. I'm always mad. But I always try to pull my anger into a nonviolent container. <laughs> so I wrote a hostage letter pass it on to the security guard and ask the women to surround the hall. So we surrounded the hall when they read the letter, all we could hear on the overhead speakers, oh my God, General Lema and her troops have overtaken the peace hall. General Lema. In that moment, powerful men started jumping out of the window. <laughs> the security came and said they were arresting me. And I said, sure, if you intend to arrest me, I was stripped naked for you. So I started to remove my clothes. And people say, why would you do that? I said, well, it's one thing to say I was raped. It's one thing to say I was forced to disrobe. It's another thing to take the last shred of my integrity and give it to you willingly. And that was my ultimate protest. And then the negotiator came, interacted with us, and we went back. Afterwards, it was less than two weeks when a peace agreement was signed. So let's slow down for a second. Um, they're going to arrest you. Yes. And you say... For obstructing justice. For obstructing justice. Yes. Because we had blocked it. How can a group of unarmed women obstruct justice? And so the theory of the women surrounding the peace negotiations was you have to... You will stay in there. No food is coming here. No water. You came pale. You came hungry. You came broke. All of a sudden, you're looking good. You're getting over $1,000 a day from the UN. And that's one of the problems with peace negotiations. As long as they are paying parties to the conflict to sit at the table. They will drag it for as long as they can because it is increasing their bank accounts. So the women had had enough of that. We were, like, these people were having pool parties, girls in bikinis in the evening. All around the pool, they're drinking champagne. People who came looking very horrible. Were, and some of them were even coming to us, the protesters, to proposition us for relationships. You know, so we had to do something to make them know that you can't do this like a safari when yeah. people are dying in yeah. our country. 
And so I just want to talk a little bit about the moment where you decided that you would strip for them to, to arrest you. Uh, what, did, what did that mean to them? Why did that stop the arrest? Well, the one thing is that when a woman, in most of our cultures in Africa, when a woman decides to strip naked in protest, it's a sign of bad luck. Mm -hmm. So the men who were around did not want to, um, yeah, so they, they were like hands off, you know. And then someone asked one of the warlords later on, how is it that in a room filled with men who were responsible for thousands of women being <coughs> raped, how is one woman threatening to, to strip naked, um, make you all sober? And he said, it was in that moment that all of us asked ourselves, what have we done to bring our mothers to this place? And so two weeks later, we had a peace agreement. Did we rest? No. We went back home. Because a lot of people, after the signing of peace agreements, will say, oh, we have peace. No. Signing of peace agreement is not necessarily peace. Involving the community in the implementation. So we took that, those 300 pages of whatever they had written in there and laid benchmarks and sent them to rural communities and said to women, in this time, if you don't see this happening, protest. If you don't see that happening, protest. So we're able to easily and effectively go through the process of DDR, the disarmament, demobilization of soldiers. We went through the process of civic and voters' education. We went through the process of elections and elected Africa's first female president. Wow. Once we got the first female president elected, we were, I personally had had enough, and I wanted to come to school. I needed to breathe. So I left that job and came to the US to do my master's. The drive behind that was, oh, you are just an activist. So I wanted to interrogate whether what we had done was actual peace building. And when I came to school, I realized that I came for the paper because the theory, the theory that I was learning aligned exactly with the practice without ever knowing yet. Well, I could continue to ask you questions for a lot longer than the session is that we have. I'd love to perhaps open it up. Sure. This incredible work led to the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> and more. There's a lot more to the story, but I, I don't want to monopolize the Q&A with Lema, and I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions as well. Yes, okay. okay so um, thank you so much for your work and also the clear um, presentation to us. Um, about movement building, what I notice is there a lot of egos, you know, lots of people, different ideas, about how to do things. And you talked about some issues within the movement. Um, how do you, and I don't think it's a one-time thing, so how do you manage that and still keep the focus? Mm. What gets you to go back when people say to you, you know, you have to do this? Well, we, we really didn't know what the hell we were doing. I'll say that for free. Um, two years ago, we sat down as women, oh, three, and we had a conversation about why did we succeed? We actually brought all of the leaders together and we spent a night at my house. And someone said, because we were naive. Mm -hmm. Say we did, no one knew Nobel, no one knew awards. We were just determined to change the tide in our country. That's the first thing. The second thing was that as the leader of the group, I knew that there were many opportunities. The first time I went to sit with a very large NGO to raise money, the head of that NGO said to me, we can't give you money, but I want to hire you. This is in the heat of the war. I have children. My sister is not working. We, I'm the one, everyone's depending on I had no job. And he said, we'll pay you 1,500 US dollars. We'll send you to the US immediately for brush up training, and we want you to be our peace and conflict manager. 
I said to him, no. I came to ask you for money for my movement. I didn't come to ask you for a job. He gave me $100 from his pocket, and I was very happy because it could buy water for several days. When the chairman, when the transitional government was formed, the then president of the transitional government asked me to serve in his cabinet. I told him no. The difference with movements today, once the leader gets to some form of notoriety, they want to maximize every personal benefit. I was in Cameroon working with a group of women. I went to do citizen, some kind of peace exploratory mission. And there are women in there who have done fantastic work. Once they came to the UN and got the first award, second award, Oxford offered them scholarship. They left their movement and they came to school. It's the same with South Sudan and many other places. I always say to young people, the essence of why you started a movement is either to bring peace into your community or to achieve a specific goal. All of the opportunities that you see around you will come if you stay on the course. That's the second thing. The third thing, as a movement, there was never a day that we allow any conflict to spill, spill over. Every day after our work, we went into one room as leaders and asked three questions. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? How can we improve? improve? If there was any problems during the day, it came out. We never left until we settled it and were able to plan for the next day. So issues arose, but we never allow it to go over us or go beyond the day or beyond the movement. There were times that it got so heated, people would pick up chairs. Remember now, we're in the midst of war. Some of these women are still scaring scars of rape and abuse that they have not said to anyone. Children have died, and we're all trying to navigate to find peace. People will pick up chairs and want to fight. We have to step in between them. But when we step out in the street, what the world saw was a united force of women fighting for peace. Today, many movements, and maybe because we didn't have social media, it helped us. Because the whole thing of who's getting a million likes and two million likes <laughs> would have you know, distracted us. But we didn't have that kind of problem. So the problems we had were good problems. It kept us grounded. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a student who has a comment or a question. Yes. Oh, there was a quote that you said that really struck me. You said, you cannot give what you don't have. So um, how did you achieve that inner peace to give and to lead all those women? You ha I had to take a step back. There were moments, days that I had to take some step back, whether it was at night in my private space, and say, I just need to exhale for a moment. Let me, I, if someone has a piece, piece of tissue, I, I, I want to. Um, just a tiny piece of tissue paper. I want to, I like to give illustration because it sticks. Okay, so think of a sponge. The sponge that you use to wash your dishes. Uh, and you know, this is an African house. <laughs> I, I, I don't use the dishwasher. It's, I feel like they miss something. So you see, this is, this is dry. And this is you. Hmm? and you're doing movement building or you're in a world loaded with conflict, every time you deal with one problem, you absorb some of it. The next problem, you absorb. And you keep absorbing, 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 absorbing until a lot of us moving around are dripping sponges. <laughs> How do you give me hope when your capacity for giving hope is? The only way you can continue to do what you do, you have to squeeze out and start the process all over. That you need inner peace to do peace. You need clarity of mind to write your papers. 
You need an understanding of compassion to give compassion. But if you have exhausted every piece of it, you can't give it. And that is where stepping back or having a circle, for us women, we had a circle and we used to call it shedding off the weight. We'll go into our room, we'll put a pail of water down. We just made up stuff. We'll have a bottle of perfume, a new towel, a new bath soap, and we'll turn off the light and give the can, each person a candle. So the person who will light their candle, the light is on you, you can talk. Exhale. In that room, we use the phrase of our secret society. Nothing said in that room came outside. And women talked about their struggle. That was how we took out everything that we carried. And when we did that, you slept till like two the next day. And then you are re-energized to carry on the work that you do. But for many activists around the world today, they keep going, going, doing, 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 doing. And then they're causing more harm than good because they are dripping sponges and all of the dirt. Everywhere they go, they're dripping dirt all over the place. And if, well, why am I not getting and giving the results that I expect? Mm. Because you need to take, it's a time now for you to take a step back to do that. It's been 10 years since I won the Nobel. And it's been 10 years since I've been doing this. I'm very grateful. If no one is grateful for COVID, I am. <laughs> because I had nine months to exhale, to write, to think. Now I'm being intentional about squeezing out. So October this year, anyone wants me on their calendar? Hell no. I'm going to India for three weeks and just be quiet. And when I come back, I will be able to give off myself. But baby girl, if you don't have money in your bank account, how do you write a check? You can't give what you don't have. Emotionally, spiritually, financially, remember this. Don't try to be a counselor when you don't have counsel in you. I Am I making sense? Oh, all? I see a lot of nods. I see a lot of nods. Yeah. Any other question? Please don't be shy. Ask me anything, even about my love life. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, there are a lot of places in the world that lack peace right now, and I really appreciate this idea of how much work it takes to construct, to cultivate peace. Um, I, I just happen to be focused on Russia and Ukraine because of my own commitments and friendships and. So much of what you described is about uh, presence, right? Your ability to be present there. And, and this war is, is one that we can't be present. And I don't know. I mean, I just wondered if there's any insight about a different kind of war, about how we can cultivate peace from afar, or do we need to be working in our own communities? Any, any wisdom you have about how to cultivate peace in the face of that kind of war? Well, the one thing you need to understand, and people need to take the chill pill <laughs> and stop thinking that no one in Ukraine or Russia is doing peace work. There's lots. Mm -hmm. There are women on the ground. And then also first, let me take a step back. What is our definition of peace? Is it just any wars? I've come to realize that that is not it. Peace for me is not just the absence of war. Peace is the presence of conditions that dignifies all of us. Having said that, in the Ukraine today, there are definitely women in communities that are finding bread to give to those who can afford bread. There are those who are healing sick people. There are those who are taking children who are orphans. Those are the activists on the ground. There are many videos, I saw one video of there are people confronting the Russian soldiers in their communities. You have to leave. Those are the ones who are, people are there doing that kind of work. When we sit afar, I tell people what we do, whether by getting in touch or by whatever. As someone who was on the ground during the war in Liberia, I always pray to read something from women around the world encouraging our work. 
And so from a distance, if we can do a lot of those, especially in this social media era, lauding the women for being there for humanitarian support for this, for that. And then if we're able to identify some of them writing letters to them, one of my most pleasant memories of our work we did was when we came to Ghana for the peace talk. Women from northern Ghana, where they had war at the time, formed a delegation and came to sit with us for one week to protest. That solidarity I will never forget. And these are the kinds of things that our world needs to do. Are there young people? There are many students who are still stuck in the Ukraine. How do we identify them, like medical students who are there giving assistance and sending letters to them to say, keep on the good work the world is watching? But also there's another side of the story. There are women in Russia who are against this war. Mm -hmm. And I, I recently read an article where a group of women were saying, Russia is not Putin, and Putin is not Russia. Mm -hmm. And there are many Russians who are left, they live in Georgia, Armenia, in Turkey. They can't even walk the streets because people are hating on them, mm -hmm. insulting them and saying, so we also need to find those groups. One story I read, one girl said she made these buttons and she, she were giving them to Russians who were in Turkey to put on their clothes. Russians in solidarity with Ukrainians. Wow. So we need to identify all of these different groups. And sometimes it's just compassion. We don't have to do it all. One thing I said in there that the world lacks is hope. Hope is like a mist for young people, for old people. So if you're able to be that person in your space that will inspire hope in one person in a conflict context, you've done more good than a peace talk. Can you um, say again what you just said about peace is not just the absence of war. It's the conditions. It's the presence, the presence. of conditions that dignifies all of us. The presence of conditions that dignify all of us. Michelle, <laughs> if you have the condition, if you have food and you are not hungry, that's a condition. If you're homeless, that's a condition that yeah. is not dignifiable. If you, and so most times in this country, people tend to think that, oh, we don't need peace. You may not have war, but you do not have peace. Conditions that dignify people. Because you don't have those conditions that dignifies everyone. Yeah. And so that's why, should we all work for peace? Yes. In our own way, food banks yeah. are peace movements. Homeless shelters are peace movements. Anything that provides some kind of dignity. Battered women shelters. Battered women shelters. A peace organizations. Yeah. yeah. I just love this expansive vision of what the peace movement is. It's really beautiful. Another student. Yes. Um, I was wondering, after all your hardships in life, including, you know, your relationship, <coughs> war, and, you know, your children, how did you, like, how did you still have that hope that you um, just discussed? And, like, how did, did you ever feel like, you weren't enough, and especially since you were a new mother, did you ever feel like motherhood con conflicted with what was going on in your life? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I don't want to lie to you to say that it's been a bed of roses <laughs> and that I'm very strong. There are days that I cried. There was a one point in my life where I tried to take my own life. It was very hard. And that was way before I started the peace movement. It was very hard. I overcame that by the grace of God. I overcame the low self-esteem. I told you the story. And every time I tell, even now as I sit <laughs> in this place where people think, ha -ha, she has it all, and this to get there. That's not true. <laughs> I is crazy. <laughs> I'm at a place right now where I'm trying to 
reevaluate my life. What do I want to do? How do I want to achieve that? Where do I want to go? How do I want to spend my time and my energy? So it, it's, it's, it's always there. But how you find your answers is the most important thing. My faith in God is very important to me. That's one. My community. There are few individuals that I'm able to reach out to and they will just allow me to rent. Last Sunday, I met one of the persons and as soon as she said hi, it was like, do you know that those children and do you know and do and she sat patiently for one hour and listened to me. That's your real friend? Yeah. So you will always, to all the young people, there's no way. Don't let anyone fool you to say that you come to this point in life and the struggle ends. It's a persistent thing. If you, you, you conquer one, my friends and I laugh and say it's either one thing or the other. By the time you think you've succeeded in this area, there's another thing that you have to deal with and another thing that you have to deal with. And the hardest part is that when you become a public figure and trying to keep it together, mm -hmm. you know, like everyone is watching. You can't be fake because you will fail. My dear, there is so much freedom in being authentic. Mm -hmm. My kids and I will sit and have conversations. They are well-read kids. And I will say one word, and they will say, Mama, are you trying to say this other thing? And I will say, yes. Oh, my God. How do you give those speeches? <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter, too. <laughs> but I have never, and even with the, the people that I interact with, I never present myself as knowing it all. I never present myself as being the superwoman. When my kids see me in my kitchen with four big pots on the stove, they know that there's trouble in my life. <laughs> because I cook when I'm stressed, I cook when I'm sad, and sometimes I'm there, all you hear is Jesus. <gasps> How am I going to overcome this? Oh, Jesus, Jesus. But then I give them a very nice pot of soup afterwards, but I'm pouring it all in there. You see, one of the things that our world has filled us in is to constantly tell us that you cannot be vulnerable with those you love. Mm -hmm. And so if those you love, you can't be vulnerable. That's why a lot of people, including young people, go out there and they, they find themselves in trouble. You got to find a place in a space where you're comfortable to be vulnerable. And I'm blessed to have a lot of people around me that I can be vulnerable with, you know. And so it's, it's been hell. My 10 year old and my 29 year old sons, two boys, have kept me on my knees more than the rest of my six children. <laughs> I talk about my 10 year old wherever. As a matter of fact, when we take him to restaurants in Liberia, in this country, they will say it's an abuse. If I see a pastor in that restaurant, I'm holding his hand. We go to the pastor table and say, Pastor, can you pray for Joe? <laughs> and as they are praying, both him and I, we are kneeling down and he's there. Amen, amen, amen. I don't hide the fact that we have this crisis with this child. <laughs> we have this crisis with that other child. It's, I, I, I constantly talk about my struggles. Last year, one of my children got sick. And everyone in our communities don't talk about mental health issues. But I've been very open about it. And you will be shocked to see, once I'd said it once, more than 10 people in my community said, oh, my child had it, but we kept it on a down low. In Liberia, we say, when I die, my body will not smell even if they don't embalm me. It means that I'm not keeping anything in here, anything toxic. I will put it out there. Every pain, I will put it out there. 
And you may not be able to do that kind of openness with a lot of people, but it sets you free. By the way, I like your hair. You have very good hair. <laughs> I like your hair, too. <laughs> I think we see a pattern. <laughs> Any other questions? What's, what's our time? Just want to check on the time, Bernadette. Uh, maybe five more minutes. Five more minutes, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, first I want to say thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm very inspired. You have a very powerful voice. You spoke about an experience with your profession that led you to realize the importance of your voice. I just wanted to know how you overcame that barrier of silence and what steps you took to finding your voice. You know, after that one paper incident, girl, I was like this. Lema, you are already down. At that moment in my life, I was broke. My parents had given me one bedroom in their house. I slept on the bed with my four children. Whatever they gave us to eat was what we ate. I had no income. My mother sold shortbread. So you can imagine my kids carry shortbread to school for lunch every day for maybe two years. So I was down, you know, down, down, down. And the only place you can go is further down. When I stood up to talk to that professor, it was with that sense of he who's down, fear no fall. Or she who's down, fear no fall. And after I spoke and he gave me that paperback, it wasn't automatic, but it was a gradual process of raising my hands. I used to go to church and sit in the back of the church because one day I went to church and as I passed, a group of women said, oh my God, here comes the baby factory. I took, you know, like Michael Jackson doing the backslide. <laughs> That's how I went back. And I never entered that church. But when I started finding my voice, I wore those four children like a badge of honor. And you know, do you know that when you are afraid, God will just send you one thing that will expose you? My third child would go to church and strip naked and walk in the middle of the church. <laughs> and in that moment, my sister and I would be like, who's going to own him today? Not me. Not me. <laughs> But I started wearing them everywhere I went. Slowly, I would talk about my four children. And I would talk about my life. And I started asking myself, what do I have to offer the world? Because, you know, usually, in order for you to find your voice, you have to find your ability too. Your voice is linked to your ability. At that time, I didn't feel like I had a lot to offer. So at church... My mother was the president of the women's organization, and they were always looking for people to write for them. So I started writing their notes. Eventually, there would be planning programs, and I would sit and listen to them planning programs and say, but maybe if you did it this way, it would work, and if you did it that way. And then one day, out of nowhere, they said, this year, you are going to plan the Mother's Day program. I was like, gosh, I can't. <gasps> and they said you will make it. And those women guided me. And that program, the church talked about it for months because it was so beautiful. I put my all into it. And you know, once, one of the things that we don't do enough is celebrate our small victories. Yes. So every time I scored one, I took time, and I already had a cheering squad, my four children. So we'll go in the room, and I'll say, y'all clap for mommy. It was by force <laughs> that mommy did a good thing today, and we'll say, yes, she did. Even if they didn't understand, because we're very young, <laughs> mommy did a good thing. But they were my audience to cheer me on. Slowly, slowly, slowly. And today, the voice is so loud where I am now is trying to tell you something. <laughs> Don't speak. <laughs> and when it doesn't want to come from through your mother, I have to do like this because it will slip from under my chin. 
But it's every process in life, my dear students and audience, is a journey, it's not a process. Finding your voice is a journey. Finding your ability is a journey. But it's about trusting the process also, trusting yourself to trust the process. So it took a while, but today I'm there. And today I say to every young person, you may not be a loud mouth, but don't ever be silent. Don't ever let people judge you based on your silence. Is she smart? Is she not smart? There are many different things that I, I, I tell my children and those that I interact with about life. Yeah. Where are you from originally? I was born here, but my parents were from Haiti. One last one, and then I get a go. <laughs> Student? Yes, it came. You said you quit your abusive relationship, and then you started a movement, and it must have been really scary because it's not easy to quit. Oh, I ran away before I started a movement, girl. Ooh, <laughs> I was gone before. But I tell you one thing about being in an abusive relationship. Each of us carry a threshold in us. Each of us carry a moral boundary. Each of us carry a, a space that is the threshold. So even if you condone abuse, watch yourself. There are certain kinds of abuse that will make you cringe. That's your threshold. <clears throat> I used to be slapped around, called stupid, and I stayed. The day my partner insulted me publicly, I checked out of the relationship mentally. I was gone. And it took me two years to physically leave. That's also a process. Yes. But, so, and I knew I had to leave physically, and this is a very, because of the private abuse. And then I found out I was pregnant with my fourth child. I left with nothing but my three and a half children. And it was at that point that I almost took my own life. But that threshold was there. And years later, I sat down and said, why was that your threshold? Growing up in our neighborhood, there was this one uncle who used to beat his wife. And I always questioned it. But the day he physically, verbally abused her, not physically, but verbally, like, really abused her. As a maybe eight, nine-year-old child, I was raging. Something in me, it's okay for you to fight in your room, but it's not okay for you to insult her in front, in front of everyone. And maybe that's where my threshold grew. The day my partner came out of the room and called me a stupid effing in front of everyone. <laughs> I just looked at him. Henceforth, I was a robot. And when it got worse, we slept on the bed. His head was down, my feet was there. And that I knew at that moment, it is the death of this. So if you are a young woman or a young man and you find yourself in a relationship or you see something that will make you cringe, that is your threshold. And if it happens to you, don't stay. Because if you stay, it becomes normal and then there's no way to break free again. I recognize it and I left. Do I regret? No. But one of the other things that I want to say to you all don't hold anything, that bitterness that people carry. 
I lived in that circle of being very angry, bitter at this person until I eventually had to let them, set them free. Set them free in order for me to be free. And one day when I teach a class on reconciliation in this school, I will tell you all how it happens. <laughs> oh, we can't wait for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is so special to have you here, and the questions were wonderful. I really appreciate everyone engaging, and um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. 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 Thank you.